Well, Wintim asked me to give my testimony tonight. Um, I just put it before the Lord. And the main purpose is to glorify God, isn't it? With our lives and our testimony. And as I was seeking the Lord this week, what do you want me to say to my brethren in Ball Green on Sunday night? He said, it's all about heaven. I couldn't believe it when Ted started to preach this morning about heaven. Share with them about the encounters you've had with heaven in your life. And I began to think about it and seek the Lord. And he said to me, I want to remind you that your life was planned before the foundation of the world. And it's only as the years roll on that you realize, with hindsight, it's like looking back at a picture of God's amazing grace and blessing over your life, isn't it? Because my life really started um, in 1934, and that was four years before I was born. <laughs> because there was a very sick 26-year-old lying in the cottage under the window. She'd had to separate from her husband because she was so sick and they were in poverty. Her husband had no job. It was the 30s. He kept on having jobs and being laid off and jobs and being laid off. So they couldn't keep the house on. So they had to go back to their respective parents. And um, that young lady was so sick. And um, friends and relatives came into the cottage and they said to her mother, remove the feather bed that she's lying on. It's an easier death. And, you know, that was old wives' tales probably, but that's how it operated in those days. And they removed the feather bed and put her onto a flock bed. And prayer was made without ceasing, day and night in the little Methodist church down the road, because there was amazing love, amazing scriptures being shared. And one afternoon, her sisters were out at work in the silk mills in Leek, and her mother was working in the kitchen, preparing the evening meal. And she fell into a deep, deep sleep. And she woke up with a vision. And she was in a room. And it was all set with placemats and a huge table. And she went round to look for her name. And the voice said, not yet, Mary. Not yet. And she woke up and she said, Mum, I'm going to get better. And from that moment, prayer was answered. And that miracle came. And <laughs> I'm very emotional about that because that was my mum. Now, God started to work in their lives because all the time he was allowing them to trust him, wasn't he? To trust. And they had a little house, and two years later, I came along. <laughs> so I was very much a miracle baby. Uh, they didn't expect to have any more children, which they didn't, so I was an only one. But I was absolutely born in a family that were bathed in prayer and trusted God. And all through my life, um, my, I could hear my father praying in his bedroom. Whatever problems came along, it was taken to the Lord. And so uh, there I was, um, growing up in that kind of atmosphere. Now, I was taught to pray every night, and as we went up to bed, you know, come on, Janet, say your prayers, and, you know, uh, 
pray for your, thank the Lord for the day and pray for all the family and everything like that. And so um, I go to school and, you know, I was happy at school. And uh, family relationships weren't all that rosy at times between my mom and her mother-in-law. Not unusual, is it, really? <laughs> and so one day, this little six-year-old thought, Granny's being nasty to my mom. <laughs> so I went into Granny's house, which she was, uh, you know, they were okay. They'd gotten, they bought land and they built a house. And Granny was well off. So I went into Granny's house and I got all her jewellery out, out of the drawer and I took it to my mum in our little house and I said, there you are mum, you have that jewellery from... <laughs> you have that jewellery from Granny. She, you know, you must have that. And my mother was horrified. She said, oh my goodness, whatever have you done? Come back, you naughty little girl. And I had to go back and say sorry and all the jewellery had to be returned. I wasn't very, very popular, I can tell you. Anyway, that was my first experience of, of you know, thinking I knew Jesus and, you know, thinking I, he was my loving Heavenly Father. But that was very naughty. <laughs> anyway, you know, as you grow up, you start to love the Lord, you start to uh, lean on his word and you start to, to um, uh, sort of live the word of God. But you see, if you're born in a garage, it does not make you a Christian, it doesn't make you a car, does it? And so the, the, the life that followed was... Um, trusting and difficult because um, my parents wanted me to be in the bank. They didn't. I said, I want to be a nurse, Dad. No, you can't be a nurse. It, you know, I had pneumonia when I was a year and a half and they nearly lost me and I was had a weak sort of chest. You can't do that. You're not well enough to do it. Um, so I had to trundle along to Manchester, do my bank exams and I worked in the bank and oh I hated it I absolutely hated it it was like a mausoleum because all these very you know pale faced gentlemen in black suits at the front in those days and everybody was very serious and I, I was on a machine that did credits and debits and credits and debits and oh I can't bear this Lord you are there you're my loving heavenly father get me out of this Lord it's like being in prison <laughs> so eventually my father agreed and I, I went into nursing and he said I'll give you a month you'll soon be home you'll soon be home but I wasn't and I have had the most wonderful career I could ever imagine it was just what I was born for and my Christian life went on and I met Christian nurses who were uh, going out on the mission field and we formed, uh, there was already formulated a Nurses Christian Fellowship there at the North Staffs and I took a, a, a part in that responsibility uh, for the running of it with, with colleagues because as you can imagine they were coming and going. Uh, but we had the most tremendous fun. And, you know, you just wonder about the depth of your Christian life because in my own church at home, we had a new minister. And uh, he was he was a Dr. Marsh in, in the end, but he was the Reverend Marsh. He was such a nice chap and he was a bachelor. But I thought, I don't like some of the things you say, Mr. Marsh. You know, it was quite a, a character in those days. And he was very, he was very keen on moral wrong, you know, the Oxford group in, in Oxford. It was by a man called Frank Bookman. I don't know if you've ever read any of the books, but um, they wanted to live by four absolutes. Absolute love, absolute unselfishness, absolute honesty and absolute truth. So I said to my colleagues, he's putting the cart before the horse. You have to be saved first before you, before you walk along there. So my colleague said to me, let's get him. <laughs> Very naughty. So I invited him to the Nurses Christian Fellowship and I got my colleague, my 
wonderful Christian friends planted in the audience, you know. We'll ask him some questions. We'll tie him up about salvation. Oh dear, we'll be naughty, really. Honestly, I can't believe what I did. Anyway, the, um, the time went on so long. And I looked at the clock and I said, oh, Mr. Marsh, it's after 10 o'clock. Uh, I, I can't let you out of the nurse's home. You'll, you have to go out the big front doors. So I took him to the big front doors and they were locked. So I said, you can't go past the night, the night porter. He said, am I locked in the nurse's home? I said, I'm afraid you are. So I said, I'll have to let you out through a window. So I had to, you know, walk along with him to, it was actually the ladies' loo. And I, I had to take him and he said, hold my Bible and hold my trilby hat. And as he climbed out through the window, his foot went on the, uh, on the, on the window sill, and it all crumbled and fell, and he fell in a heap down. I thought, oh, if night sister comes, because in those days, life was so straight, um, you know, uh, and I would have been on the mat with Matron the next morning and had penance to do or whatever it was. Anyway, poor Mr. Marsh, bless him. He never let go of his moral rearmament. And um, we didn't really get salvation preached at the Little Methodist Church. So the next, um, that was just fun, really. And I went to Manchester to do my um, uh, midwifery training and then my health visiting training. And I had got two very sick parents by this time. My father had emphysema and a heart condition, and my mum continued really with her um, gastric problems that she'd had for, for many, many years. We had lots of prayer for healing, but she didn't, they didn't get healed. And I wanted to go on the mission field. And so I, had, I knew then my first big disappointments because um, coming along life's road, you are, you get estranged by thinking, well, Lord, I love you and I'm learning your word, but what's happening in my life? Mm -hmm. And I wanted life to be exciting mm -hmm. because God gave me such a, a thrill with music. I love my music. Mm -hmm. uh, I love beautiful things. I loved art galleries. I loved history. I loved a sense of time, to look back on time, to see what happened when and why in the whole pan panorama of, of life. And I found it very exciting. And um, at the time, uh, I was playing tennis and I loved my sport. And uh, in, in the tennis club, it was a, a, a Methodist tennis club originally, but they, the folks there, you know, the young chaps and everything, they weren't really Christians. Mm -hmm. And of course, I began to think, oh, am I going to get married or not? I don't know. And of course, um, I went out with John for a bit and he said, will you marry me, Janet? And I said, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Knowing he was, and he said, well, I'm an, I'm, I'm an atheist. And, uh, I said, Lord, I can't, I just can't do it. And he, he was a really nice guy, really, and he said, I made my decision to be an atheist. I took him with some friends to the um, Carnforth Cape and Ray Bible School, where Marge was, and uh, he came back saying, it's having no effect on me at all. So I said, well, I'm sorry, I am a Christian. I love the Lord. I cannot join with you in life um, if if you don't love the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he never did marry, and he died a few years ago. And then I met a Christian in the tennis club. Um, we went out with each other about nine years, on and off and on and off. But um, he was a really nice, kind man, but he just couldn't take the step of marriage and he never got married and he died so you see you've got to believe that that's god's purpose yeah, yeah. because you just have to have 
that peace. Because there's absolutely nothing without the peace of God. And uh, I wanted to serve the Lord. And he had first choice. And I said, Lord, you will always have first choice in my life. But it doesn't stop the life force and the zoe of life wanting the superlatives. And I went, uh, my father said, well, why don't you get leave Stoke on Trent and do something nice, just while mum and I are okay. So um, I thought, well, where do I go, Lord? So we prayed about it. Um, my, we'd had a new superintendent health visitor in Stoke, and she said, would you like to come out to dinner one night? And she said to me, you know, you need to go somewhere like Oxford or Cambridge. But she said, they never advertise. Well, we had the Nursing Times and there was two posts for Oxford. I couldn't believe it. And so I went and I got the job and I thought, well, I've just got to go in absolute faith. And because I just took that step in faith, it's always God bless his faith. You know, taking that step. And it was so hard. And I remember going down on the train and my mother was crying. And my father said, you know, go, go, go. Because he was the, you know, one for adventure like me. I was quite like him. And um, so I went to, um, into the, what was the Cowley Road. Do you remember British Leyland and it was the Cowley? Yeah. Well, I went into the Cowley Road Health Centre where there was accommodation for nurses. And our superintendent, <coughs> she was a Tommy's nurse. She trained at Guy's in London. And uh, she said, you can only stay here two nights, only two nights, and then you'll have to find accommodation. Well, Oxford is between two rivers, the Thames and the Charwell, and this is very damp. And I thought, oh, it's so expensive. Where am I going to live, Lord? Because, it, you know, you had to go either into live in a cellar. Quite a lot of the students were living in cellars. Mm. And I thought, I'll never survive because it's so damp. Within that 48 hours, the whole place was made obsolete, and I was there for 18 months, paying £2.50 a week. It was absolutely marvellous. And there I met my friend Judith, who was here with us last week as the missionary in Africa, and another friend, uh, Elena. We're still friends all these years later. And I, I learned then to really, really trust God with everything. And um, I was determined to give the gospel to the doctors I was working with. And um, the uh, superintendent health visitor, Miss Gilbertson, she said, I'm putting you with three very difficult doctors. Very difficult. Um, and she said, and if you can't cope, she said, I'll move you. And I thought, I will cope. <laughs> <laughs> but only by the power of the Lord. And I gave the gospel to um, Dr. Bedford. Her, her father was a Holly Street specialist. And the other GP, there were three women. And because we were three women, we had a 75% Muslim caseload. So this was how the Lord was teaching me to learn about the Muslim faith and to learn about, um, you know, their way of life. And I found I had to love them. Mm -hmm. I had to sit round late at night, uh, cross-legged on a stone floor, teaching them how to feed their babies, how to feed their family, communicating with them in English, uh, getting them urbanised, and um, things like that. And one very funny little episode was um, we used to do a test for congenital dislocation of the hip in babies. And uh, we found that if we found it early enough, the babies wouldn't be, um, you know, crippled or, or, or paralyzed. So um, we fa I found one and I had to take this baby and I was hoping to take the mother to the Nuffield Hospital, the orthopaedic hospital. Went along with my car, and she wouldn't come, she just handed me the baby. 
So I said, she said, no, 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 you take the, take the baby. And I couldn't believe how they can just hand their babies over to me. It was in a carry cot. There was no seatbelts in those days. And I got up to the uh, waiting room. And I sat with a Pakistani baby on my knee. And two, two ladies went past. <laughs> <laughs> It was so funny. And, and then you, you see, you start to learn about prejudice and attitudes, and it's all so wrong. It was good that it wasn't so, um, you know, it, it's not so bad now, is it? For that sort of thing. But it was quite funny. And I started to love the people and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. And I was going to the Big St. Ebbs Church in Oxford. It was an Anglican church and my father was very worried about that, you know, because he was very, very um, protective that I wouldn't get the right kind of uh, closeness to the Lord in an Anglican church. But those Anglican people yeah. were marvellous. Yeah. They were hospitable, they were unselfish, mm -hmm. they were um, caring, and they were sincere friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't long before I was um, godmother to some of the children and things like that. And these people, I couldn't believe it, uh, this family took an interest in me. And he was the son of the of Sir Roger Hollis, who was head of MI5. And you wouldn't have known, and all these very high people, and high powered people, and I thought, goodness me, I'm in the midst of all this. How do I cope? But you don't cope because they are not prejudiced. No. And it was lovely and, and loving. And life went on like that until one night I had a dream. And this was a major encounter with God. And I woke up in this dream and I saw an ambulance and I saw someone on the floor and I actually saw this person hemorrhage. And I woke up and I was very disturbed by this dream. And I was disturbed for quite a bit and then I went to bed and I woke up probably about 12 o'clock and it wasn't a dream and it wasn't a vision. I was uh, quite wide awake and the Lord stood beside me. I was, I was alarmed, I was terrified. And all I could say was that it was a figure of transparent, white but the presence mm. was amazing mm. and i got i went to sleep because i was scared mm. and then i woke up again and it was still there and so i thought am i having a samuel experience lord and i got out of bed went into my lounge and i said Lord, what do you want to say to me? And the presence followed me. And it was nothing, but I, I'd been turned down for the mission field. And, I, you know, my idea of what I wanted to do, I wanted to go on the mission field. Um, <coughs> and I, I actually wanted to be a doctor instead of a nurse. And I wanted... Um, that very badly, but I fluffed my mouth so I couldn't do it. And I said, why didn't you let me be a doctor? I wanted to be a doctor. And I didn't say anything else and I came back. And a few days later, I had a phone call and it was from home. Janet, could you just drop everything and come home? Dad's very ill. Well, actually, my dad had been found dead. And that was the Holy Spirit yeah. warning me that my life was going to change drastically. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was very fond of my dad. And so you have to go through all the bereavement. Mm -hmm. 
and you have to go through caring for a very bereaved and sick mum. Mm. And uh, we know that we were surrounded by prayer, and those people in the Anglican Church in Oxford were marvellous, mm. absolutely marvellous to us. And we put it before the Lord, do I come home? Do we move down to Oxford? Do we sell the house at Stockton Brook? What do we do? And um, Mum had a word from the Lord. The wheat and the tares grow together till the harvest. And she felt, no matter where we are, in whatever church, the wheat and the tares grow together. Yeah. And she wanted to stay at home. Um, I said, well, I'm still going to pray because I was very happy in what I was doing with my Muslim families and everything. Um, but um, what happened? Um, one morning I was driving down to um, South Oxford and in my spirit, that hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, Onward Christian Soldiers, and I said, do something, Lord, because don't let it be me, let it be you. So I put, my phone was ringing in the office, and it was Miss Alcock from Newcastle. She said, we are desperate for health visitors here. Can we offer you a job? Wow. And I said, well, I can't, I can't come <coughs> yet. I want to stay until the end of March. But she said, come, come up and have an interview. There's a job for you here. Well, Oxford didn't want me to leave, and uh, you know they wanted me in Newcastle. But I knew that I knew that I knew yeah. that that was God in yeah. my life, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, I came home, and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to pack up here. And uh, I thought, that day I was desperate, what should I do? And uh, I went to see a new baby, and I said to the lady, it'll be somebody else when I come next time, not me. And she said, um, I've got 10 tea chests in the cellar. And she said, I feel as if I've got to ask you, can you help me, can you help me get rid of them? And I've got no, nothing to pack up in. And so a friend from St. Ed's came along, and we took 10, ten tea chests into my flat, and pack the whole lot up yeah. to go back to Stoke. It was just amazing. And, you know, God's hand and God's word, we lived on every day. And, and you have to, it says, feed on my word, feed on my word. And without that, where would we have been? Absolutely nowhere. And God began to bless us by taking us into um, a new knowledge of the Spirit, a new knowledge of the Holy Spirit, because um, in the Methodist Church, we didn't talk about the baptism of the Spirit, and they didn't in the Anglican Church either. It was all about service, and it is so important that we give our lives to service, but it's twice as hard if you don't know the Holy Spirit. So I heard that the Reverend Fred Howell at Congleton, he was having amazing healings at his church. And my mum was constantly calling. And we kept praising the Lord and giving and going to meetings, but she was constantly calling. So I rang him up and he said, um, I said, I just wondered if you'd come and pray for my mum. It was winter time, the snow was on the ground. Um, I said, I'm sorry to ask you in such bad way. It's all right, I'll come and pray for you, Mummy said. He said, Janet, have you ever spoken in tongues? <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't really want anything to do with that. <laughs> um, I really don't want anything to do with that, Pastor Hall. I said, I I've seen, I've met people in my career who've, you know, gone over the top and they've got very, you know, very mixed up in the mind about things. Oh, he said, I see, right, okay, well, I'll come down at seven o'clock this night. So he came in, praising the Lord, and he says, come on, Janet, open your mouth. He put a hand on my head, 
and the new language came out. It was absolutely amazing, amazing. And uh, he, um, he prayed for my mum and she just got healed. It, at the, that time, you know, she kept going down into different illnesses, but you know, it seemed out of one thing into another. And they prayed for a spirit of infirmity and uh, every time God delivered her, time and time and time again, it was marvellous. And so I went to a Trevor Deary meeting, and I think um, Phil and Elaine said, rang me, because if there was anything that was really wonderful going on in the spirit, Phil would ring me. Yeah. Because I've known Phil since he was at Hanley High School with his mum, known him many, many years. And so, uh, I could not believe the power of the spirit in that meeting. I couldn't believe it. Trevor Deering had been into Kowloon Island, Hong Kong, and he'd gone to preach the gospel in the prisons, and men had just curled up like snakes on the, the snakes that they'd been worshiping. They curled up and they were delivered from that evil, evil thing. <coughs> Because the power of God was so marvellous, absolutely strong, and they were delivered. And as he came in, praising the Lord, and it came to me then, how important it is to praise. We need to praise, and to have that spirit of praise. And he, uh, I just couldn't stand up. We stood in a row, and he put a hand, and I... I just don't know, I was flat on the floor. And I wasn't that sort, you know, being medical and logical, it was quite uh, contrary to, to what I was doing. So that was such a wonderful experience. And just as we prayed in tongues, and as we worshiped, <laughs> the problems we had in our lives were just, were just melting in front of us. It was just absolutely amazing. Why is it so hard to people who don't know Jesus and you tell them about the power of God and the Spirit of God, this barrier of evil to keep them out of the kingdom? And you know, we, we are the righteousness of Christ. We are, we have his righteousness, which is just amazingly wonderful. I... We'll go back to the personal things in my life because it has been a life of service. I've loved it. I am totally satisfied with my life in that way. But I sometimes, you know, you lose your peace. And I wrote to Dr. Marion Ashton. She was a wonderfully saved, born again consultant in hospital. Her husband was Dr. Lee Ashton. I don't know if anybody's heard of her. Uh, I think she's gone to be with the Lord now anyway. But he was out at Manorham Hospital uh, in Thailand, just working on fingers, lep uh, leprosy fingers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends, John and Anne Townsend, were working at Manorham Hospital. They were both doctors, and they were working in the hospital. And uh, they had, I won't go into it now, but they had terrible backlash from the evil one. The coach that they were on fell and several of the missionaries were killed and all sorts of terrible things happened. But uh, Dr. Lee was there and Dr. Marion said, you write to me, Janet, about the subject of peace. Why don't you come and stay with me, with a, a group of other people? And I think uh, Rita Jacobs was there. John Jacobs was a national golfer. People like that, they were all seeking the Lord. And it really, really helped at that stage because she took us to Genesis. And uh, Genesis 1, 2 and 3. And how we are created with God's human needs within us. God's created needs. And I have, that's really helped me in my Christian life, that we all need to be accepted. We all need to be unique, and we are unique. We've got DNA, haven't we? That's unique. We all need relationship. 
and you learn that God wants to bless us. He wants us blessed and satisfied. And I feel that, you know, we won't be totally satisfied till we get to heaven. But, you know, there is a place to go. That place with the still small voice. And then we run with horses, Tim. We run with horses when we've been to that place and heard that still small voice. I feel as if I've said enough tonight. And um, there's been many, many other encounters with God, and I'll probably look at my notes and say, oh, I didn't share that, or I didn't share this. But, you know, that is, is just amazing. And I just love this little church. I have learned so much from Tim's marvelous teacher. We've got people who are born again, loving, and, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm just thanking different people for Ernie and Rita who befriended me, affirmed me, and blessed me with their close friendship. And it's lovely, really. So, you know, but the precious thing is our Saviour, mm. who is always near. His promises mm. are yea and amen. And he longs to bless us far more than we expect. Yes. Yes. Amen.